I was a field engineer doing software installation and commissioning on telecom equipment controllers. These units are located at cell sites tower bases which your phone connects to in order to provide you service and connectivity from your cell service provider. A lot of these towers are in very very remote places. In this particular project I would go in the day after the construction crews completed their tower and electrical work. I would be by myself with just my work truck, air card and laptop. This particular site was in rural Virginia. I probably still have the email from when I was on that project with the site's coordinates, so I will try and post those later if I find them. If it's not against policy, of course. The site was about 2-3 miles into the deep woods of Virginia. It was near a now abandoned mine of some sort, not sure exactly what they were mining for. But there was very old mining carts and drilling equipment scattered about as I was driving to the site. It was starting to get dark, but this was supposed to be a quick in and out type deal. LTE commissioning usually takes one hour or less, and since I saw a Civil War era cemetery connected to the gravel road which leads to the site, I was in more of a rush than usual. See the thing is, when you try and rush things, especially because of fear, you will F up. And boy did I F up. Something that should have taken one hour took over four. When I finally completed my work and closed my laptop screen, I realized how dark it was outside, and that I was all alone at the base of a tower in the middle of nowhere. I quickly gathered my belongings and headed towards my car, which was probably 60 yards away at the gate of the compound where the tower was located. When I tried to close the gate behind me, it was so dark that I couldn't see the chain and lock, so I put my car in reverse, put the e-brake up and shut off the ignition. This way my reverse lights were lighting up the gate for me so I could close it. Just trying to give you an idea of the utter darkness I was in. After all that I headed down the trail to the secondary gate, which leads to the site, about half mile from the actual compound. Same situation as before, too dark so had the car in reverse. Well, when trying to close this gate, I heard in the distance what I can only describe as the most menacing and evil female laughter. It sounded like it was pretty far away, but I got shook to the bone. I left that secondary gate wide open and noped the hell out of there. On the drive out, I remembered the cemetery I had to drive by. Needless to say, I didn't look at it when drove past it on the way out. After speaking with the construction crew that built the site, they also said they heard people whispering in the woods at night, but could never spot anyone. They also heard what sounded like people picking at rock with tools, but they were certain no other construction or anything was taking place anywhere for miles on end. I am in the U.S. Coast Guard, and I recently was assigned to a ship. I was going through our log books to look up something and noticed that on the bridge a unknown blue light was observed beneath the water's surface the night before. This intrigued me so I started looking through more of the logs. Apparently every two three weeks they enter lights of varying colors in places you would not expect. Usually white, red or green lights are on the horizon or in the sky ships and aircraft. But they seem to report colored lights under the water sometimes moving around, sometimes stationary. Lights in the sky moving at extreme speeds, then immediately stopping or disappearing altogether. Sometimes lights are visible to the naked eye, but when we try to look at it with FLIR or night vision, they are undetectable. I was in high school that time and right in front of our house, there was a secluded park. That park is empty and peaceful, but it gets crowded at a certain time of the day because of dog owners. So my dogs are not friendly, and because of that we take them out a little bit early than others. Like usual, I checked the park out from window, and there was just a man walking around the park. I took my two dogs Golden Retriever and Yorkshire Terrier and went to park. I was listening to music and waiting for my dogs do their thing. I realized that bald and middle-aged man was glancing at us, but he was keeping a distance. 
I usually know everyone that comes to that park, but it was my first time seeing that guy. I am a paranoid person and wanted to go, but my small dog were still looking for a place to poo-poo. When my dog was sniffing around, we had to stop walking. That guy got close to us and said, I have a friend and he will bring two aggressive pit bulls here. You should get out. I was surprised and just said eight and got out. Didn't even question and walked out of the park. We could see the entire park clearly from our windows. I almost knew all the dogs that hang around in the park, and even know their personalities. I never saw or heard about pit bulls nearby. After some time passed, no one was coming to the park. That man was walking kinda wobbly and talking to himself. He was holding some kind of small bag in his hand, and he was smelling that bag. We just understood immediately, but we were quite amazed by his trick to get me out. After some minutes, a grandpa and his grandchild were walking the hallway to park. That guy didn't even wait them to enter and ran to them and yelled like a crazy. That poor old man was scared a lot. He didn't say anything and just left immediately. We were fine with him getting high in our park up until now. He took a thick tree branch and ran after cats. I got even more mad and made my mom call the police. They arrived 30 minutes later. That crazy guy walked on the police too. They took him and we didn't see him that day. After a winter, we saw him again. We were like, ugh, here we go again. It was our dog's toilet time again. I was studying to my exams and asked my mom to take them out. There was also a gardener and some kids in the park. She decided to go because she was not alone with him. Dogs did their thing and she was just going out. She was just about to leave he walked on my mom and raised his arm. But thankfully he was so wobbly, he couldn't get much close. The gardener was just watching from the corner. She screamed a little and went back home. He got taken by polices for three times, but he always got back on summer days. My dad was a merchant sailor. He has seen and done some shit. Some things he still won't even tell me. Apparently there was this crew once probably more than once that included this crazy guy that slept with a hatchet, who was one room over from my dad, and also a guy who everyone hated. One day they woke up and the guy everyone hated was missing. There was some blood around one of the portholes. The way my dad puts it, you can't fit a grown man through one of those portholes whole. I've tried, so probably murder, and no one gave a shit. I have an older guy friend who grew up in 1950s Alaska, where his dad was a bush pilot. So one day, they're out flying around just for a nice day, and suddenly the entire sky goes red. Complete red and clouds and no radio. At the time, he's old enough to understand what was going on, but still young that they just don't talk about it. His dad continues flying for hours and not a word, but still thinking that the Cold War had just ended in thermonuclear holocaust. It wasn't out of the question. Alaska was a target close to Russia, and this was the height of the Cold War. The sky is still forever red. Finally, they start to run out of fuel. They have to land, but they don't know what's going on and zero ability to find out. His dad eases the plane down, finds the landing strip, and goes in for an emergency landing. They make it down perfectly, no hiccups, bumps, or anything. The airport is besides itself red sky and an unannounced emergency landing, and a crew guy comes up to help them out. What's going on? His dad asked. You have no idea just how lucky you are. A volcano just went off, and you've been flying through the debris. Thank God no thermonuclear warfare, and they were stupidly lucky that the plane didn't stall out in the middle of nowhere Alaska, with a volcano spewing nearby. When I was around 12-15, I was hunting with my dad and his hunting buddy. I was with my dad and our friend was off a different trail. 
At the end of the day, we always met up where our trails met to walk back to the truck together. My dad was trying to teach our friend over the radios we used to use and couldn't get anything from him for about 20 minutes. As my dad and I are almost to the crossing, he comes on the radio and says he's on his way. We get there and soon after our friend shows up entirely out of breath and sweating like a pig. Mind you, we're in the north woods of Wisconsin during gun deer season, so he has very heavy clothing on and his spot was about one miles down the trail. He goes on to tell us why he didn't answer and what happened. He was sitting in his ground blind and saw some movement in front of him. About 50 yards ahead, he saw a black bear cub and only the cub. It sat down and started clawing at a tree trunk. He didn't move or make any noise because he knew Mama Bear was close and didn't want her to find him. He sat there watching the cub for over an hour constantly trying to find Mama Bear, but could not get eyes on her. Finally, the cub lumbered off and he decided it was safe to move out. By the time he answered us, it was already getting past dusk and starting to get dark. As he was walking, he heard a breath and felt hot warm air on the back of his neck. The man is six feet four, so there's only two things that could have been tall enough to do that. A person or a standing bear. He panicked and sprinted for over a mile down the trail until he saw us. Luckily, he wasn't chased and made it back safely, just sweaty and beat. I used to hunt as a kid with my uncle and grandpa. The first time I killed a deer, I was alone covering my side of the mountain while they ran the deer towards me. I shot a buck right in the side, but he was just a button buck only nubs for horns. I thought it was a doe, so that's why I shot it. I was so excited, right up until I walked up to the deer and it was gasping for air. I shot it in the lung, it was horrible. I felt awful, I cried. I didn't know what I had just done. When my uncle found me like 45 minutes later me sitting next to the deer I just killed, he was so excited. But he could tell I wasn't. We dragged it out of the woods, butchered it up that night and made burgers. I couldn't finish mine, just didn't feel right. Never went hunting again, I was 15 or 16 at the time, so I was old enough to understand what was going on. Anytime anyone talks about hunting, I think back to that morning. I have no problem with people hunting by all means, but I could never go again. I-26 female recently moved from the US to the Balkans for a summer legal internship. After a few days of getting settled in my home for the summer, I decided to sign up for a gym nearby my apartment to serve as a self-care ritual and blow off steam after tough work days. Coming home from my first workout at the new gym, Endorphins on 100, I noticed at a crosswalk that a man across from this busy street where I was stopped was staring at me. Now, this is not super uncommon as I have found in my new home, and I have gotten used to dealing with occasional male stares, but they are usually very brief. This guy, however, was not looking away. I stared back for a full beat, so I know he knows I saw him hoping that would be the end of it, and then turn my head away to continue down the street trying to avoid a creepy feeling that this wasn't the end of the interaction. From what I could tell, he didn't cross the lengthy street to meet me and probably just continued down from his side. Next thing I know, about two minutes later, I'm at a crosswalk about to cross when I see him in my peripheral next to me at the stop. How he crossed the street and sped up to meet me so quickly is either a reflection of his cunning and athletic prowess or my general lack of observational skills. Standing next to me now, he is still staring at me, but I try not to tip him off to my noticing this. I take off as fast as I can when it's safe to cross the crosswalk, and naturally he matches my pace, a step or so behind me still staring. Here I find myself in a familiar situation that I imagine many who have been followed also find themselves in. It is a critical juncture, if you will, where you ask, is this someone following me or a silly misunderstanding? I begin to ask myself, am I overreacting? 
I have been followed many a time before, sadly. And so I have found that the best way to handle it is try to cut the baby in half, so to speak. I give them the benefit of the doubt to prove to me they aren't doing what I fear they are doing, while also trying to avoid any situation that would escalate the danger or cue him off to where I am going. Trust but verify. So I decide to zip quickly toward another street. Not my own, we were like one block from my apartment by the time I noticed him at the crosswalk with me, in the hopes that he would prove me wrong and not continue to follow me. This was a busy intersection, and there were about six different streets to follow from the crosswalk. He follows me down this random street of choice, where there is truly only residential buildings, no stores or restaurants he could be headed toward to explain him choosing this street unless he lived nearby. I do something I have done before when followed to test the other person. I slow down and speed up my pace randomly to see if they match mine or like a normal person heading somewhere, try to walk by me as there was plenty of room to do so on this street. Within a block or so I realized he was definitely following, definitely still staring. But not only that, with every few steps, I felt his presence, keeping pace, was also subtly getting closer and closer to me. The sun is setting at this point, and we are walking towards a part of town I don't know as well. The spirit moves and I decide to make a break for it. I slow down as slow as I have gone throughout this whole pursuit, checking my peripheral and jettison myself across the street until I get to the other side. I look back once I am there to see that he is now looking across the street and moving toward it to follow me more. But this time, I give him the meanest glare I can muster and reach for my bag as if to suggest that I reaching for pepper spray or something hadn't bought some yet in reality because I had just moved to town a few days before. He notices the gestures, makes eye contact, stops, and then literally turns his head away to feign looking at the numbers on the street like he was lost or looking for a specific spot, as if he hasn't been slowing up and speeding down with me for the past ten minutes, not looking anywhere but at my backside. Acting 010 for capturing the innocence of someone definitely, not creepily following a woman half his age back from the gym for twenty plus minutes. He continues to pretend to look around, glance back at me, look around some more, glance back at me, and when he looks away for the third time, I decide now is the time to truly make a break for it. I begin booking it down the opposite street, while occasionally peering back to see if he kept following. I take a bunch of well-lit, busy streets, employing random unnecessary turns, as I have when I have been followed before. Eventually, once I check out the whole street and feel confident I have lost him, I finally calculate my way back home. The next day, I asked a friend from work who is local to take me to get some pepper spray. I bought a mini version, the smallest size that can easily fit a purse. The pepper spray's brand's name for a bottle of this size is literally called Madam, which is emblazoned across the side of the bottle in bright pink lettering. This happened to my grandfather years ago. I guess he was out hunting and walking around in some woods, maybe five miles from a main road near where my family settled north of Pittsburgh. He said that he started seeing these burnt-out candles and started picking them up for some reason. He followed them for like a 100 yards, and at the very end, there was a circle of black candles with a hole in the ground that looked to be a grave. He brought all the candles home and my grandma yelled at him and made him throw them away. I was canoeing into my hunting area a few years back. Came around a bend and saw some teenagers, maybe 20 year olds walking down the train tracks. I waved hello and they proceeded to shoot a couple bullets in the river 40 yards in front and behind my boat. I have never been so angry in my whole life. I thought about going ashore downstream and sneaking up behind them to let a few bullets rip myself, but was afraid I might accidentally kill someone.
This happened about two years ago on October 27th. I do a lot of hiking and I wanted to share with you all what is without a doubt one of the strangest things that I have experienced while hiking. While on the way back from the summit of Mount San Jacinto in California, a fairly popular trail. Just as day was changing over to dusk about 4 miles and 2,000 vertical feet, a good 2-3 hour hike from the tram, we spotted a woman dressed in all black flapper attire with the exception of a white scarf. This woman was in dress shoes and carrying a very nice beaded purse. She was walking very intently and at a hurried pace up the mountain. If you're familiar with the hike, it's at the top of the Wellman Divide. Nearly without words I asked her if she was lost, to which she replied. I'm on the trail errant I. Her face looked gray and her lips were sort of blue. It was pretty cold outside. So as quickly as she had passed us she was gone. My friend and myself looked at each other like, now we have seen everything. After conversations with other hikers on the way down that had also seen her, I was kiddingly remarking that I was sure we had seen some sort of ghost. Looking for a lost love much like the mysterious lady in black story folklore. It was a truly bizarre experience. About an hour later we were resting at Round Valley and we saw her again. Keep in mind, this is literally in the middle of the forest at 9,000 feet elevation. A good two hours hike from anything and the temps were around 35 degrees. The fact that is so close to Halloween was not lost on me either. At any rate, I make no claims of the supernatural, but I'm not ruling it out. But I thought everyone might enjoy the story and the pictures of this truly strange encounter. I worked offshore for five years as an ROV pilot, the robots that go underwater. I have seen some odd things. Worked on a job where the field we were working on has barrels at bottom of ocean. We were told we couldn't go near these with a robot. Apparently these were dumped by the US government during Cold War era. Who knows what was in those barrels, I've seen all kinds of rare creatures, including exclusive six-skill sharks. One of the cooler things I saw was an eel eating another eel the exact same size. Imagine a snake underwater eating another snake exact same size. That was pretty cool because it looked like the eel detached its jaw like a snake and everything. Also is seen giant bluefin tuna. Tuna in general can be anywhere from surface to a couple thousand feet down. The ability to dive like that still amazes me. I worked in the oil spill in the Gulf. To see oil just pour out like that is something we have all seen, but to be there and realize that's just below you a mile below is something else. For me, it was crazy to see that many robots underwater at same time as you have usually max four two vessels, but rarely. It was chaotic as heck. The vessels out there were so close we could almost just have conversations with people by shouting, which is very rare. One of the crazy things I won't forget is two vessels were flaring off literally just burning off oil, and I could feel the heat from their vessel on the one I was. I have whole stories I could talk about that really, but to be part of something that was that huge, even though it wasn't a good thing in our history, I can still say I was part of it and be proud to stop the spill. I was a U.S. Army infantryman deployed to Afghanistan in 26, 2007 on the Pakistan border. I spent the majority of my nighttime deployment sitting outside of the FOB in mounted OPS because the CO thought if we did this then, the enemy wouldn't move at night. Which was ridiculous because nothing happens at night over there. Seriously, they don't have street lights or electricity, so unless it's a full moon you could trip into a wadi and break your neck. But anyway. So I spend 16 months over there taking turns sitting in the turret of the truck staring out into darkness. One I seeing green from NODS and the other seeing nothing from the pitch black. I got very accustomed to viewing the world this way and if anything moved my eyes would pick it up instantly. Most of the time it was dogs or sheep or whatever so no big deal. So eight months in, I lose one of my best friends to a landmine. 
one of the shittiest days of my life. Us being infantry, we got about two hours back at the FOB to try to comprehend what just happened before the CO sends us back out on patrol, yay. So I'm sitting there in the turret staring out into the darkness, as usual thinking about the things that had just gone down. So obviously my mind isn't in the best place. Regardless, as I am staring out into the darkness, my non-night vision, I catches some movement off to my right and I distinctly see the silhouette of a person. This person is moving around the outside of our perimeter, and I figuratively shit my pants since this hasn't happened at all during my time there. So naturally I snap my head towards the movement to get a good picture of this person with my night vision to attempt to figure out what kind of crazy local villager is trying to get shot. Nothing is there. Creepy as F. So I figure I'm just stressed from losing my friend and calm myself down and settle back in for the rest of guard duty. So I go back to looking straight ahead and sure as shit as soon as my eyes get back to 12 o'clock, I see movement again out of my peripheral. Figurative pants shitting happens again. Again nothing is there through night vision. Still creepy as F. So at this point I've about had it with this crazy country and being shot at and all that stuff so I think to myself. Okay F it, let's see what happens. So I turn my head back to 12 and watch out of my peripheral vision, and I distinctly remember the shape of a person walking around the outside of our perimeter. I can only see this dark figure when I'm not looking directly at it. But like I said at this point I have no FS left to give, so I sit and watch. As I sit and watch I get the feeling that I know the figure who is patrolling our perimeter, and I am filled with the thought that it was my buddy who we had just lost earlier that day. Creepy instantly turned to comforting and I sat and watched the movement as long as I could. I still to the day believe it was him. So that's my story. I used to hike a park near my house, had been hanging out there for years. One time I was walking the main trail when I noticed an opening in the brush leading to an area I had never been before. I love exploring so I of course decided to check it out. I was walking around for a while when I noticed a fairly large bone in the leaves. I wasn't too concerned as we lived in a very ethnic neighborhood and I just assumed it was a cow or pig bone that someone had left from butchering, but then I noticed the very human-looking pelvic bone laying close by. I stood there for a moment sort of comparing my pelvis to the one on the ground before getting my knife out and getting the F out of there. I called the police and led them to the bones, and they agreed that the remains were human, although they theorized it was probably a homeless person. Grew up playing in the woods behind our house, cross-country skiing and snowmobiling in the winter, ice skating on the pond. There were no other houses up there, occasionally a snowmobile would pass through, but not often. One summer when I was a bit older, 15 maybe, went up there to ride my friend's dirt bike. There were some jumps up at the top of a cliff that we would take turns hitting, so I'm riding on the back up through the woods, and as we are passing the pond, there is a tent. I say WTF and tell my friend to stop. I get off to investigate while he stays on the bike, but shuts it off. I was approaching the tent from the back, and the window was open, and I see the tent is full of clothes, food, liquor, beer. Of course, I'm rattling off all of this to my friend when I happen to look up and see that there is someone sitting in the doorway of the tent with their back to me. They haven't moved and are just facing forward with their back to me, which is odd because clearly they heard me. At this point I turn around and start waving to my friend and mouthing, let's get out of here, as if I can somehow sneak away now. Finally the guy says very calmly, come around. I stopped in my tracks and looked back, he's still not facing me and he says it again, come around. At this point my friend is starting the dirt bike, and he yells, What did you say? The response again is just, Come around. I jump on the back of the bike and we tear out of there up to the top of the cliff. There is a dirt access road up to the top as there is a water tower up there, 
but it's a pretty rough road, so we assume this dude isn't gonna drive up there. We stop the bike and head over to the edge of the cliff to see if this guy is following us. Sure enough, he comes walking out of the woods from the same trail we came out on. He then proceeds to walk over towards some bushes and starts pulling branches down to reveal a gray truck that he had hidden. After uncovering the truck, he opens a box in the back and pulls out a rifle or a shotgun, then walks around and gets in the driver's side and starts hauling ass up the road. We take off running, I just run into the woods, my friend is screaming at me to get on the bike, but I tell him to just go and I keep running off into the woods. The truck comes to the top and stops by the water tower. I'm a good distance into the woods, but I can see the wheels of the truck, and I hear the guy get out and start walking around. At this point I'm scared shitless, but just trying not to make any noise. It seems like forever. But he finally gets in his truck and drives off. So I start running through the woods again, away from the way we came. I eventually come out to a big field. There is a house at the other end of the field, and I know the people who live there. I really don't want to go back through the woods to get home, so I figure maybe they can give me a ride. So I'm walking through the field and I see a gray truck driving up the road at the other side of the field. There are round hay bales scattered around the field, so I duck behind one of those and peer out to see the truck is stopped, just sitting there. Now what? So I make my way back towards the woods keeping the hay bale between me and the truck. Eventually he just drives off. I eventually make it to the house at the edge of the field. Tell them what happened, of course they will give me a ride, and they are calling the police. Police go up and check it out. The tent is there, but no one is there. They tell my parents that they don't know who it was, but that someone had skipped out at the local halfway house, and they hadn't seen him in about a week. He drives a gray truck. A week or so later, my friend comes by on his dirt bike and says there are a bunch of state cops up by the pond, so we ride over there to see what's up. The tent has been burned and a bunch of other stuff was still smoldering, Never found out if they ever found the guy or not. Back in August 2006, I was 20 years old and working in a deli near my house. While I also attended a community college nearby, I remember it was a warm summer night and I was working till close, which was 7 p.m. and at the time it was around 6.30 p.m. The only two people left in the deli were my boss and I. I remember I was stocking drinks in the cooler towards the back of the store when I heard the front door open so naturally I looked, and it was a guy I had never seen before. And working at the same deli for eight plus years you tend to remember people, and so I figured he might have been from out of town. He had red hair and it almost looked like an afro which I thought was strange. He walks back towards me, and he goes into the cooler and grabs a peach snapple, and soon as he walked past me the smell hit me. So I motioned to my boss and pinched my nose, and he and I had a brief chuckle before I started walking to the front to ring the guy up. I get to the counter, and soon as I looked up at this guy, I felt my stomach drop. His eyes were black, and he had pale skin and this blank stare. It's hard to explain, but I felt as if he was looking through me and not at me. I asked him if he needed a bag, and I got no response he paid for the Snapple and walked outside of the deli, and then stood at the front of the store. So we closed up the store at 7, and we started cleaning up and 7.30 comes around and I look, and this guy is still standing at the front of the store leaning up against the glass. He was so strange that my boss thought he was staking out the place waiting for us to leave, but technically he was a paying customer, so we couldn't tell him to leave just for being weird. So we shut the lights off and were walking out when my boss turns to the guy and says, Hey, I don't mind you hanging out here, but please don't lean on the glass. The guy turns to him and doesn't say a word, he just smashes the Snapple bottle on the ground at my boss's feet and my boss at the time was a big guy. I'm talking about six foot, 380 pounds and covered in tattoos. So my boss gets in his face and says, what the F is wrong with you, dude? Now you're going to clean that shit up. 
The guy stares back at him again, not staying a word, and the whole time I'm thinking to myself, this guy is either insane or has the largest testicles on earth. Then after a few seconds, he turns away and gets in his car and drives off. I go back inside and get a broom, and I swept it up and we called it a night. Wasn't the first time we had someone high come into the store. The next morning I woke up and put the news on, and the first thing I see is that guy's face. Turns out the same night he stopped by our deli. He murdered and dismembered his neighbor right down the street from the deli. The cops caught him pulling up into his parents' driveway the next morning with the women's severed head in his trunk. To this day, I wonder whether or not he committed the murder before or after he came to the deli. I don't remember seeing any blood on him, but then again, I wasn't really looking for any. I live in Marcus Hook, Pennsylvania in Delaware County. I went to college in Philadelphia. My parents moved to Florida a few months ago, but they kept their house here so I'm living in it right now. The property is along the bank of the Delaware River. The river is 20 or so yards from the back door of the house. I had found a new job and I stayed up later and later. I was bored and with nobody else to hang out with. Most nights I would wind up outside in a lawn chair, fishing in the river until three in the morning. It was on a night like this when the first incident happened. I wasn't paying too much attention around me. I was watching something on my phone and my rod started bouncing around like crazy. I jumped up to set the hook, jerking it back. The line went slack for a second and then jerked away. I figured I had a fish on, but when I tried to reel again, it wouldn't budge. I thought maybe I was snagged, but then the line snapped away again. I'm not an expert fisherman, but the way the line moved was odd. Not like a typical fish bite, but like something in the water was purposely pulling back on the line each time I did. It was almost like it was intelligent. I was a bit freaked out and I ended up just cutting the line and heading back inside. I told myself it was caught on a snag or something, but I suspected otherwise. A week later I had fallen asleep in my chair and I woke up startled after hearing a large splash in the water just a few yards out. The light from my back porch barely hit the edge of the water, and I could see a series of rings spreading out from where something had entered the water. A new set of rings then appeared a few feet away, and then again and again until they were out of sight. I was a bit baffled since catfish or bottom feeders seldom come to the surface of the water, and they rarely jump. I grabbed my gear and headed inside, but in my groggy state, I left my cutting board knife and a fresh bag of bait. I used pepperoni for catfish sitting on the ground outside. The next day I realized what I had done and I went outside to retrieve it. Everything was gone. In the patch of dirt near where I had left the stuff I could see faint prints. Some kind of thin-footed animal with only two long slender toes had been walking through the area. I also found silvery fish scales that were spread sporadically around and both prints and the scales led straight back to the water's edge. I must admit that at this point I was a little bugged out. I didn't know what to make of the evidence, but I figured that any kind of call to the police was going to get me laughed at. I tried to find information on the prints online, but with no luck. I decided that I would give fishing a rest for a while. I needed to get better sleep anyway. I was starting to get tired halfway through the day at work. Two weeks went by and I hadn't been back outside to fish. I had started dating a new girl. Between her and work I pretty much forgot all about the tracks. But then the most bizarre incident occurred. I was fast asleep in the room upstairs when I was shaken awake by my girlfriend. She told me that my dog was downstairs barking like crazy. I'm a heavy sleeper and probably wouldn't have noticed, but sure enough he was downstairs going nuts. Before I reached the stairs, the barking abruptly stopped, but then it turned into a low growl. I felt a twinge of panic. My girlfriend was behind me on the stairs and we crept down quietly. I could see the dog standing at the back door in a rigid posture growling at something outside. I walked quietly over to him and tried to calm him down. 
I was stroking his head when I heard my girlfriend let out a gasp. She was looking through the small window of the back door. I stood up to look for myself. Unmistakably, there were two bipedal creatures, no more than three feet tall, walking around my backyard. It was dark and the lights were off, but I could make out a pallid silver color to them. They had no eyes that I could see, but something like a fin was running along the spine of each creature. We stood frozen for a few moments watching these two creatures. At one point, they ambled over to each other. I swear that they were making hand gestures toward the house. My girlfriend saw this too and whispered that she was going to call the cops. She ran upstairs to grab her phone while I stayed and watched for a few more minutes. My dog started barking again and this time both creatures just walked away towards the river and disappeared under the water. The police arrived about 20 minutes later and looked around. They didn't see any sign of the creatures but said that they had found some wet prints outside. They were the exact same ones that I had seen on the ground a few weeks ago. Since no crime was committed, they didn't seem too interested. But the officers took my report and told me to call again if anything else happened. So this was a month ago. I've looked online for any kind of information on these creatures, but I can't find anything. I haven't gotten a good night's sleep since, and my girlfriend has refused to come back to the house. Do you have any idea what these creatures may have been? My event took place on 2021 at 18 in Denver, Colorado. In the two half years following my event, I have had a host of very strange phenomena happen to me. I have been shy about talking about these things from what I believe is a result of my interaction with this object. The event started with me witnessing a bright yellow cylinder craft hovering above Interstate 70 just east of Denver. At the time I felt a sudden fear, but that feeling quickly changed to euphoria. I don't remember much after that other than waking in my bed the next morning. About two months after my encounter sighting, all of the moles on my body began to fade and then completely disappear. To date, five moles have completely disappeared and nine more are in different states of fading. About five months after this event occurred, all of the hair on my arms and legs began to change to light blonde and mass. I have medium brown hair and am only 31 years old. Although I originally considered premature graying, I began to notice the individual hairs changed color from the root upwards. And when the hair started to change, it took about five days for the complete hair change. The top of the hair fading from medium brown to reddish to blonde. So it was not as if it was growing out this color and no amount of sun exposure has ever caused lightning like this on me before. Also, the hairs that have changed colors have actually changed in consistency. They were originally a medium coarseness, and now they are feather soft fine. About two months ago, the spider veins in my legs began to fade, and now one that I have had for about seven years is completely gone, and another is fading rapidly. Since this has occurred, I have had dreams almost nightly of entities who talk to me and claim to be intelligent species from somewhere else and they keep trying to give me strange information I don't understand. I woke up a few times and caught myself uttering some language that I have never heard before. But I have ruled out speaking in tongues because it seems this language seems to have structure and form. I also have feelings of hot and cold in different parts of my body. I get pulsating feelings on the bottom of my feet up my legs down my arms and on the palms of my hands. Sometimes this pulsating becomes so intense it is painful. I have also felt this heat pulsating feeling right below my eyes, between my eyes, and in the front of my brain. I am very upset and confused as to what is going on with me. I live on the back of the ranch where I work. I got the job in college and I've graduated since but working the olive orchard or vineyard since has been pretty gratifying. My first year living on site, third year working there, I got really drunk and drove the utility vehicle. I'm responsible for out into the enchanted forest. This is the place the cows run off to when a bad rainstorm comes through. 
The ranch hand before me took off immediately when my boss told him to move out so I could take over, and when I did so there were 15 head of cattle. I was on top of this number and counted them each and every day I fed them. Some calves had come in, so the number had jumped up. But the point was that if something happened to a particular cow, I would notice by the end of the day and could search for her or him if it was a bull. Anyways, I'm toasted and enjoying revving this Kawasaki mule up and down the different hilly sections of the far end of the ranch by starlight when a shit ton of vultures burst into the air in front of me. I screech to a halt as a horrible smell fills the air and find myself staring into the maggoty eyes of a recently dead cow. She's still got flesh, so she hasn't been dead long, but I don't recognize her from the small herd I deal with every day. There's a thick scent of death and something else in the air. I leave the headlights on the mule running and circle around her with my LED flashlight and see a huge, sickly flesh balloon dropped out from between her hind legs. Working on a ranch, you get used to death because it's a huge part of the whole thing. But the strange smell behind the familiar scent was this pouch coming out of her containing her stillborn fetus. As best I can figure, she had died attempting to give birth after the herd had rejected her following her isolation from them during some kind of sickness under the previous ranch hand's term, something he had never mentioned to me or my boss. The smell was worse the next day when I used a forklift to carry or drag her into a shallow grave in order to dump lime all over her, but stumbling across her while chasing a stargazing spot is forever etched into my mind. During the summer of 1989, my girlfriend and I decided to take a few days and go visit my mother and family in Spokane, Washington. We lived in Southern California and I have driven north to visit her a few times. I usually stick to the main interstates for fear of running out of gas. Anyway, on this particular drive I decided to take a shortcut through Oregon to try and save some time. I saw on the map that Highway 97 would be a good route to take. I knew that Bend was a fairly good-sized town with services if I needed them. The night was beautiful with a little moonlight, so I opened up the moonroof on the car so I could peek up at it from time to time. The road had tall timbers on both sides, and it was pitch black beyond them. My girlfriend was asleep at the time, the road took a slow curve to the right. I was probably driving around 50-55 miles per hour, when suddenly to my right my headlights lit up a huge hairy creature. It was walking upright on two legs and heading the same direction I was traveling so I couldn't see a face. I could make out its height of about 7-8 feet. I had to look up out of the windshield at it. It had reddish, dirty brown hair, broad shoulders and a short neck with a rounded head. I quickly put my foot on the brake, hoping my tail lights would give my a view from my rear view mirror, but it didn't work. I took the next turn out which was a few hundred feet down the road. I woke up my girlfriend and told her what I saw. At first she thought I was kidding around until I turned the car around and went back to see if it was still there. No luck, it must have got spooked and made off into the woods. I'm an avid hunter and outdoorsman. I know what bears and elk and moose look like, and this was neither. I know what I saw, and it was him. I will never forget that night. When I tell my friends of the story, they believe me, because I'm a very trustworthy guy, and I don't make up stories for the hell of it. Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night, folks, and see you tomorrow at the same time.